MicroStar International, or their better known MSI, just released a laptop that I don't think too many people are talking about, but I was super interested in because of its truly impressive list of specs, especially for someone who edits a lot of high-res videos on a laptop. MSI sent over the new laptop called the Creator 15, and as is the usual, let's do a complete walkthrough on it where we'll go through every single spec and feature that we possibly can and also run a battery test and some performance tests and just kind of see if it's as good in real life as it is on paper. So firstly, if you're familiar with MSI, you might already think you know the Creator 15 from a while ago, but no, that was the Creator 15M, which is completely different from the Creator 15 and also isn't to be confused with the P65 Creator 15 inch laptop or the modern 15, which is a laptop that says it's aimed at creators. I don't know. Anyway, the thing that matters is that the Creator 15, which is what I have here, has the best specs of any of them. So of course, it's the one we like the best, right? Now the Creator 15 itself comes in at least five different SKUs, but they're all beasts basically with just some changes to pre-installed storage, RAM, and the biggest differences most of the time is the displays. Firstly though, they all have the same dimensions, which is 14.11 inches by 9.76 inches by 0.72 inches, and are all also 4.63 pounds. It's made out of aluminum, but I have to admit that while it is minimalistic, which I like, it does feel a little less premium compared to some other laptops made out of metal as well in the same price range for some reason. Now on the lid, we have the unmistakable MSI Dragon logo on the back that's two-tone, so it's a bit more subtle, which you'll appreciate if you're like me and you're not much of a gamer and just don't want it to scream gamer at everybody who walks by. I do question the choice though of the larger than normal, I feel like, MSI logo in the gap under the screen. They need the brand recognition, I guess though, and it's not that bad, so it's okay. For this display, we have the choice of either a 16 by 9 1080p or 4K screen, and you could have it in both resolutions with or without touch capabilities as well. Now I opted for the 4K non-touch as it saves a bit of money while keeping all the other specs at their highest level when I personally don't use a touch screen on my laptop very often. That screen though uses what they call a true pixel display. But what that means is that it covers 100% of the Adobe RGB color gamut, important to those of us that edit photos or videos and Adobe programs in particular, and that's combined with a Delta E less than two. Now what that is, is a measurement of the difference in perceived color from what's on the screen with real life. And the lower the number, the better. Anything under two basically is considered negligible to the human eye. They also claim that each panel is individually calibrated at the factory and certified by Calman, a big time color calibration company. All of this, of course, helps the case for this being aimed at professional creators, of course. Above that screen, we have a 720p webcam that looks and sounds like this. And I feel like it's kind of more important nowadays than it used to be for how the quality of this is because we're all kind of working from home and using this for Zoom calls, etc. But unfortunately, most computers don't have very good webcams or microphones, and this is kind of par for the course, too. That webcam also has the added infrared hardware that is required to work with Windows Hello to allow you to use your face to log into the computer. Beneath the screen, we have our white backlit keyboard. No crazy RGB here. Again, calm down. This is a professional laptop, and you're professional, okay? The keys are nice enough to type on with enough travel to feel satisfying, which at first I felt was a bit squishy, but after using it for a while, I've actually kind of grown to it and like the softer feeling actually. My only complaint about the keyboard is that they squished a column of keys over here to the right that normally would be on the function keys above. So the keyboard feels just slightly off to the left. Now, it's not a big deal though. It just takes a little getting used to. And they did add some interesting buttons in their place up here at the top, like this swap button to be able to rotate the screen 180 degrees so that you can use the lay flat hinge to show your work to someone, say, sitting across from you. Keyboard backlight control button, which does what you think it does. A dedicated microphone on off switch, etc. Now for speakers, we have dual two watt speakers, each of which are located in these slits in the front and they sound like this. Us being here now, and it never happened. 
Between the speakers, we have our glass trackpad that is smooth, actually, and has a decent amount of travel when you push down on it to select things, which I'm not really used to, but I like. It's also a Microsoft Precision trackpad, thankfully, which, long story short, means it's more precise than other ones that aren't, and it can use the Windows built-in gestures, which I also appreciate. We also have a fingerprint scanner located in the trackpad, which, like the webcam system, is Windows Hello capable, so you have the option of using it to log into the computer instead of, or in conjunction with even, the facial recognition. And honestly, I prefer the fingerprint sensor on most laptops compared to the facial recognition myself, so that's nice. Okay, so at this point you might be like, David, none of this sounds that extraordinary for a laptop. What are you on about with the specs, etc.? Well, at this point is where it starts to get particularly interesting. And we'll start with the ports, because it basically just has all of them. On the right, we have our 3.5 millimeter audio jack for input and output, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port, a UHS-3 SD card slot, so I no longer need a dongle to pull footage from my camera, which I'm always excited to see, and an Ethernet port, which is great for when I need to dump a ton of footage from the computer to my Google Drive, and so I can plug right into my router to upload way faster, or plug directly into my NAS to offload to that. Then on the left, we have a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, an HDMI 2.0 port, a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C port that is also Thunderbolt 3 capable, so you can connect it to super fast external drives that a lot of people use, especially when creating content, monitors, and even external GPU housings technically, but you probably won't need to with this laptop, which I'll explain why in a minute. Now that Thunderbolt port also supports 100 watt USB power delivery, so you can use power delivery capable chargers or even battery packs to charge the laptop. Now, don't expect to use that to be able to use the full power of the GPU and CPU in this without the proper 230 watt charger that it comes with. But it's a nice to have, honestly, as it allows you to plug in a 65 watt power delivery charger, for example, on a plane to keep it running while you do less intensive tasks. Something that you can't do with the standard chargers for laptops with this much power, as most plane outlets turn themselves off if you plug in anything over 65 watts. It also apparently supports fast charging of any phones that you plug into the laptop through that port as well. Speaking of planes and their power limits, according to the FAA, you are not allowed to bring any device containing a battery in it that is over 100 watt hours in size. So you wanna guess how big of a battery MSI put in this laptop? 99.9 .9 watt hours. Literally the limit basically for a laptop, which I find hilarious but also I'm excited about because most laptops with this kind of power tend to have pretty poor battery life. And so to just have the largest battery basically that you can put in a laptop has to at least help a little. Speaking of, let's see how it does in a battery test using PCMark's test design for just that, instead of the usual much less scientific nine video on YouTube that I usually use. We're trying to get better. And you can use the results from this to compare to other laptops you might be looking at online that have run the same popular test. Which brings us to the next part of this impressive spec sheet. Inside, we have a 10th gen Core i7-10875H CPU that is paired with 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM in the form of two 16 gig chips in two slots. But the RAM is user upgradable, so you can swap it out with your own with a max of 64 gigs supported by the system. Then we have the option of a 512 one terabyte or two terabyte options for the M.2 2280 PCIe SSD that you can choose from, which is also user upgradable. But then they also have another empty M.2 2280 PCIe SSD slot that you can also just add another SSD to as well. I love that. So many companies nowadays don't allow you to upgrade your own RAM and storage, but it's such a cheaper way to help with multitasking and to get a lot more space in your computer. And there are even less 15 inch laptops that give you another slot so that you can add even more. I even managed to find a four and even a eight terabyte SSD that do work in here that I'll link to below for anyone curious, as well as some cheaper options that are also still pretty great. And that means that you could technically have two eight terabytes in here and have a laptop with 16 terabytes in it. It would cost more to upgrade than the laptop is probably worth, but you could. 
Even if you just use the second slot though to install another two terabytes, a much more reasonably priced size for an SSD, it's still a very useful feature, especially as someone who creates videos that take up a lot of storage. For connectivity, they just threw in the latest version of Wi-Fi for good measure called Wi-Fi 6, which you can check out my video on what that means if you're curious here. And we have Bluetooth 5.1. For the GPU, you have a choice of an RTX 2060, 2070, 2070 Super, or a 2080 Super. Can you guess which one I went for? Now, honestly, any of these options are great for video editing and even gaming, but since I've been messing with 6K raw footage lately, the option to have the newest 2080 Super, the top model from Nvidia basically, is a big deal to allow me to edit that with some extra headroom to not be worried it'll get bogged down by larger projects. Now, for anyone curious, here's how this top model faced in some popular benchmarks so that you can, again, Use the scores here to help you compare it to other models that you might be looking at that have run the same tests. For software, we're running Windows 10 Pro out of the box and unfortunately a decent amount of preloaded software. Most of it seems to be well-intentioned programs from MSI for trying to offer alternative solutions for content creators, but you also have things like Candy Crush, which are just normal Microsoft blowware, really, and even Norn Antivirus, which I despise, personally. But thankfully, for any of this, it's easy enough to right-click and uninstall any of it if you want. The one program that is actually quite useful to have is the aptly named Creator Center that lets you change the color space, which is interesting, but also has performance monitors as well as some handy profiles that you can switch for battery life versus performance options, and even make the computer run silently while limiting the power if that's a priority. And considering how loud these fans can get, it's a nice to have. For pricing, the Creator 15 starts at $17.99 for the touchscreen FHD display, 512GB SSD, and 32GB of RAM pre-installed with the RTX 2060, while still having the same CPU, plus all the ports, the giant battery, etc, etc, etc. And I know, there's a bunch of you that are running to the comments right now to tell me that the Asus G14 is a better deal. And sure, it's a little cheaper, but I would argue that for a few hundred dollars more, you get a lot more with this laptop. So it just, it might be worth checking out as well. Now on the top end of things, that changes obviously. This model I have here with a 4K non-touch screen, the touch screen version won't be out for a bit longer from the time of me making this video. And the 2080 Super GPU, it'll run for $32.99, which is also still not bad at all for everything I just mentioned compared to a lot of other competitors for the same price. And I think you might agree. But there you go guys, complete walkthrough on the Creator 15. I'll leave links below to all of the best prices that I could find for all the various models. And if you wanna learn more, you can go check those out. Hope you guys enjoyed this video though. If you did, please thumbs up it. Also check out the rest of the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next door subscribe to be notified when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.